All right, today we're going to talk about El Nino and La Nina. So instead of me explaining it, I'm going to have Van Denton, Chief Meteorologist from Fox 8, to explain El Nino, La Nina, and the effects that it has on our weather. Today we're adding a new feature. We're doing a special feature topic each week, and I'm going to jump into that before I go to student questions. And the topic I'm covering today is one that I have been asked many, many times over the years from folks that are curious because a lot of folks know the names, but they don't really understand what it means. We're talking today about El Nino and La Nina. And you will understand it when we get done today. First of all, I've got a couple of boards and then we're going to graphically show it to you. First of all, the name El Nino, it means little boy in Spanish. And this is the name it was given because of when the first El Ninos were discovered in the month of December. And in December, we have Christmas and it was named El Nino for the Christ child. A lot of people don't know that. La Nina is the opposite, and that stands for the little girl, and it's a different weather pattern, but they're in the same area, and they again have impacts on our weather patterns. It was first discovered by fishermen in the 1600s, so it's been around a long time, but people didn't really start talking about it until the 1990s, and folks are becoming, getting a little more educated about it, but it's been around for a long time. Now, to understand it, first you need to understand the weather patterns that we normally have in this region of the world. The equator is right here, South America, Central America, and North America. And right here on the equator, you've got this warm water that goes across the um, Pacific Ocean. But also off of South America, there's a pocket of cold water. That cold water gets pulled up by the airflow around and the trade winds, which are blowing in this direction. And that cold water uh, comes up some, and so that's a normal pattern. But in an El Nino year, the pattern relaxes. That airflow is not as strong. The trade winds go way down. And because of that, that warm air out in the Pacific goes back toward the east. And when it goes back toward the east, that warm water warms the air above the water. And then that starts to alter the weather patterns. One of the things that it does is it causes the Pacific jet stream to get stronger. When the Pacific jet stream gets stronger, that causes some weather changes. It causes there to be more rain across the southern parts of the country. It causes there to be more flooding. This is the time when you start hearing more about um, mudslides in places like California because they've got excessive rain coming from that stronger Pacific jet stream. Because you've got more cloud cover, it's going to be cooler across the southern parts of the country because you're blocking out sunlight. Also, you get less and weaker hurricanes due to more wind shear. So everything else is amplified, but hurricane season is actually diminish some. That's because these stronger winds blow across into the Atlantic and that strong winds cause wind shear and breaks down the hurricanes and causes them to either fall apart faster or have a harder time strengthening. So El Nino years are good years for hurricane season. They help us out. The opposite is La Nina and it's a problem. So let's talk about La Nina. La Nina the wind field is stronger, the trade winds are stronger, and what that does is that cool air that was naturally down here off of South America gets pulled farther north with the stronger currents. It brings it all the way up, even up and off to the coast of Mexico. That warm water gets pushed back across the Pacific to the west, and so now you've got cooler water in the eastern part of the Pacific at the equator, and that also causes the air above it to be cooler. What does that do? That causes that Pacific jet stream to be weaker and get pushed farther to the north. When it gets pushed farther to the north, it has these impacts on the weather. There's less rain across the southern parts of the country. There's more to the north, but there's not as much across the southern part of the country, which is where we live. And that causes more drought. That also causes the south to be warmer because with less rain, less cloud cover, more sunlight, you have warmer days. Also, in hurricane season, this pattern causes there to be more and stronger hurricanes because you no longer have the strong wind shear from the jet coming across the Atlantic so the tropical systems don't get disturbed. So that's why La Nina and El Nino are important for us as meteorologists to understand and to know when they're there so that we can better anticipate the kind of weather we may have for months into the future. 
forecasting daily weather patterns, we're only good about seven, 10 days out most of the time. But we can get global patterns like this to give us an idea of what we can expect many months into the future. And that's why we understand and study El Nino and La Nina. All right. All right. So going back, um, El Nino and La Nina, those are the weather patterns that occur in the Pacific Ocean. So now look at these photos. What are these pictures of? This one. If you said hurricanes, you are correct. So what is a hurricane? A hurricane is an intense tropical cyclone with a maximum sustained speed of at least 65 knots or 74 miles per hour. So this is a picture of a hurricane. Most of the time we look at pictures of hurricanes from the top view. This is if we took that picture and cut it in half, looking at it from the side. So there are three things that a hurricane needs to form. It needs warm ocean water, it needs moisture in the atmosphere, and it needs a wind pattern that spirals the air inward. So this graphic shows you what hurricanes need. So number one, you need that warm ocean water of at least 80 degrees. That wind is gonna to come together, number two, to force that air up. Number three, at the top, those winds are gonna flow outward, allowing the air below it to rise. Number four, the humid air rising is making the clouds. And number five, the light winds outside steer that hurricane and help it to grow. So this is just another graphic of what a hurricane needs. Hurricanes normally form from some old pressure system, old low pressure system or a tropical wave. And remember, when we talked about pressure systems, low pressure typically means lousy weather. And if the wave develops circulation and reaches speeds, reaches the winds reach a speed of 35 knots or 39 miles per hour, they are considered to be tropical storms and then they are named. Hurricanes form between five degrees latitude and 20 degrees latitude in all of the tropical oceans, except for the South Atlantic and the Eastern South Pacific. The North Pacific has the greatest number of storms, which averages 20 per year. This graphic shows you the oceans that the hurricanes occur in, in the time. So physical makeup of a hurricane, they have a diameter, so the measurement of one side to the other from less than 100 miles to over 500 miles. They have more or less of a circular eye, which is kind of like the little hole, which everything spins around, and it may be well-defined in the stronger storms. So the weather that hurricanes bring, they bring heavy rain, strong winds, large waves, and with that can bring the flooding. The Atlantic hurricane season begins June 1st and ends on November 30th. On average, there are about 10 named storms a year, and historically, September is the month with the most named storms. Hurricanes are named based on the um, places where they are originated. Um, so you see some Central and South American countries, you see some North um, or Central South American names and some North American names. Once a hurricane has reached or is considered bad enough, that name is retired. So there will never be another Hurricane Katrina. There will never be another Hurricane Hugo. Anything like that, those are retired. So the power hurricanes bring, they are ranked on a scale of one to five called the Saffir Simpson scale. You may have heard a category one storm compared to a category five. Category one is a minimal hurricane, but still needs to be taken seriously with winds between 74 to 95 miles an hour. Whereas a category five storm is catastrophic with winds that reach upwards of 155 plus miles per hour. So wind is also a big problem here in hurricanes. It can pick up any of those loose objects and sling them. So you can see but it's very dangerous. There's pieces of woods that are going, pieces of wood that are going straight through trees because of the wind picking it up. So in the United States, most people die from hurricanes or killed from freshwater flooding. 
in the world, most people die from storm surge. A storm surge happens when those um, waves reach a certain height and then rush onto land. Talking about flooding, freshwater flooding is the number one cause of death in the United States. And then this graphic shows you the costliest hurricanes in US history. If you look at the colors and the lines, that shows you the path that those storms took. So for example, Katrina is the red line. Hurricane Katrina came through Louisiana, through New Orleans, and cost about $125 billion. So hurricanes, again, form in all tropical oceans, but in other parts of the world, they are known by different names. In the Eastern Pacific, they're called typhoons, and in the Indian Ocean, they're called cyclones. So here's a question. What are the two things that are needed to kill a hurricane? You need to think about the things that are needed for a hurricane to form. Remember those three things we talked about. Now what two things are needed to kill a hurricane? If you answer cold water and land, you are correct. All right, we have another quizzes for you. So if you will go to joinmyquiz.com and enter that code and take your quizzes. Good luck.